All right. Good afternoon, everyone. We're ready to go. Um, sorry for the delay. Uh, I am Pavlos Protopapas. I am the Scientific Program Director for the Institute for Applied Computational Science. This is uh, the seminar for ICS, and as I said many times, we cover different topics in computational science in data science. Uh, just a few talks coming up. We have three more talks after the Spiro's talk today. Uh, October 25th, we're going to have Applying Data Science to Entertainment, uh, Learning from Watching for Warner Media. Uh, November 1st, we have Bob Mosers from UTC about well bounded turbulence in direct numerical simulations. And then November 15th, we have Data Science in Astronomy. Um, so that's the next three talks after Spiros. Uh, today is my honor and pleasure to introduce our Spiro, uh, speaker, uh, <laughs> Spiros Mancoridis. He's uh, received his PhD in 1996 for University of Toronto, and then he joined the faculty at Drexel University. Uh, 23 years later, he's still there. He is now a distinguished professor in computer science, and he holds the Auerbach Burger Chair in cybersecurity. Uh, his interest and his concern is about security for systems like Alexa, uh, Google Home, Siri, and the likes, or all the IoT. And today he will be talking about uh, detecting malware on virtual assistants based on behavior anomalies. Uh, please uh, help me to welcome Spiros. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the introduction, Pavlos. And, uh, uh, I, as you might know, I'm uh, visiting here uh, for the last uh, month and a half uh, on my sabbatical from Drexel, and I've had an opportunity to explore some of the uh, programs uh, offered by the Institute. I was very impressed with uh, uh, the classes I've attended in data science, uh, and uh, I also attended student presentations uh, with projects. So uh, I, I noticed that there's a lot of depth in the academic program. Uh, from the lectures, but also a lot of breadth in the projects. And a lot of, I saw a lot of different uh, applications being uh, tackled by the students. I didn't see anything in cybersecurity, which disappointed me, but uh, maybe it'll change after today. Okay, so uh, because this uh, talk is specifically tailored to the audience, so it's, it's a cybersecurity talk, but a lot of the underlying solutions are founded in data science. So I think you'll, you'll be able to make the connection. Um, even if you're not so familiar with uh, cybersecurity. Okay, so uh, let's start out talking about uh, the Internet of Things, and you must have heard this term before, IoT, Internet of Things. I use the term small IoT to mean things like uh, what you see in the slides. Uh, maybe this is a wine bottle that uh, uh, automatically keeps track of uh, when is the perfect time to open it. And maybe this is a IoT laundry machine, oops, that can uh, read labels on your clothing and appropriately set the temperature of the machine so it doesn't ruin your sweaters. And now you, you're smiling, but you know this is kind of the things that are either here or, or arriving soon. Uh, so we have intelligent everything. But these small IOTs are little little devices, and we're going to talk about these devices today. But they're also accompanied by things like a cell phone uh, application or some kind of cloud. Uh, um, infrastructure to support the device. So these are not just, you know, your Fitbit. It's also something that's integrated with uh, cloud computing and also uh, with your applications on your on your phone. I'll call medium IoT something like a smart car. So the smart car in this case, uh, you see, this is the car of the future. This is the smart car of the present. So the Google car that drives by itself, a completely autonomous vehicle. Uh, most of this stuff would have uh, seemed science fiction if I had given this talk 10 years ago. Now people casually talk about self-driving cars. We've had self-parking cars for a long time. And cars have a lot of code. And that's exciting for computing people, but also kind of terrifying from a cybersecurity point of view. We'll talk about that some more. Uh, large IoT is something that is also arriving. And here I'm talking about IoT at the level of infrastructure. So imagine that right now you have a lot of engineers doing bridge inspection. They go to bridges and they see if there are cracks, and you know they check to see if the bridge needs mending. 
But in the future, all of that will be controlled by sensors that are going to be on the bridges. Same thing with potholes on highways. I saw one of the projects uh, uh, pertaining to that. Um, also, um, I've seen some pretty cool things about uh, uh, highly seismic uh, areas like Naples and how they're using large-scale IoT to detect uh, potential eruptions of volcanoes and how that will affect the infrastructure, highways, roads, buildings, etc. So the smart cities, uh, the large-scale IoT is something that's coming and I don't know if you've heard about this but Google is uh, building a smart city in Toronto, Ontario, in Canada and uh, that's going to be pretty exciting once it's done. Uh, everything will be sort of autonomous, uh, all of the trash will be collected underground, you know, everything will look great above ground. So uh, interesting future uh, ahead. Now if you look at the projection of IoT, um, before this slide, because I've been doing this stuff for a few years, I had another slide that had a very different shape than this one. Uh, and most of it has to do with the fact that there's billions on this side, on this y-axis. IoT has taken off much faster than anyone thought. Uh, now we're talking about, uh, by 2020, having 20 billion devices, all right? Now that's a lot, that's more than the people on the planet, but as you imagine IoT scaling up to every car and every smart city, you can imagine that the sensors are going to be overwhelmingly uh, larger in number than, than the humans. Uh, it's a little bit like the uh, discussions you maybe heard about photographs. You know, there have been more pictures taken in the last year than in all the years in previous uh, history. And the reason for that is that every traffic light is taking a picture uh, of every car that's passing by, right? Taking a picture of your license plate and whatnot. So that's not surprising. Okay, this is uh, uh, Mr. Mueller, uh, who you probably have seen many times on TV testifying about the, the Mueller report. But before he was uh, doing that, he was the FBI director. And one of his famous quotes is that there are, only, there are only two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked. Okay, so he was uh, saying this in 2012. And I'm going to add to that the top of the slide saying that we're moving from the Internet of Things to the Internet of Hackable Things. Okay, so if you can imagine uh, people who are interested in cyber attack, uh, the more computers, the better. The more connected the computers, the better. Well, if you have billions and billions of connected computers, that's great. Okay, so if you're a black hat adversary, uh, this is a rich target space, and uh, there's a lot of opportunity for attack. And more than that, these IoT devices are in people's pockets. They might be your pacemaker. Uh, they might be in your car. They might be controlling your brakes. Uh, they might be flying your airplanes. So a lot of opportunity uh, for both having an interesting world, but also uh, a dangerous world. So if we look at IoT attacks so far, there have been relatively few IoT attacks. Now, why do you suppose there have been relatively few IoT attacks? I mean, if you're a bad guy, yes. Yeah, there, there's no money in hacking an IoT device. Okay, maybe, uh, you know, if I had pacemaker and I gave you a bad grade, you would want to, you know, send me a virus. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I don't have a pacemaker. Uh, but uh, obviously, the, you know, the more uh, things we have, the more, uh, the, the, you know, the attack space increases. But is it worth the hack? Okay, now. Uh, as things become more integrated, well, maybe it becomes more uh, worth it. If you're a VIP, maybe I want to hack the camera in your house uh, for extortion. You know, if, I, if you're a VIP and you're driving in a self-driving car, well, maybe I want to hack into that car and listen in on the conversations you're having in your cell phone. You know, there's a lot of uh, opportunity, and, and of course you can imagine worse things than that. But right now, what are the adversaries focusing on? Are they focusing on IoT? What do you hear about in the news about hacking? What's the most dominant hack? Everyone's getting this hack now. What, I heard? Identity, Identity theft? theft. Credit, cards. Credit cards. Uh, that's usually a side effect of the hack? Uh, pen, no, no. E email is, is, is a very good attack service. Ransomware, thank you. You're, you're on fire. All right, so maybe there's a cybersecurity project in your future. Okay, so ransomware. Uh, 
And uh, you know, ransomware is where they infect your computer, some virus infects your computer, and uses encryption to encrypt all of the data on your computer, and then you get a message saying, I'll give you the key to decrypt your data if you give me you know, 1,000 Bitcoin. Uh, and this is happening to municipalities across the country, okay? So now if you hear or read in the newspapers, you'll find out Atlanta and other municipalities have been hacked by ransomware, and a lot of these municipalities don't have backups. And of course, this is changing now. People, by the way, always back up your computer uh, because you might be attacked by ransomware. Ransomware mitigation is very easy. You just roll back to your previous backup. But if you don't have a backup, then you have to pay the Bitcoin. But you might pay the Bitcoin and not get a valid key, or maybe they didn't even encrypt your uh, data. Maybe they just randomly trashed it and told you it was encrypted. So, you know, you might not be able to get your data back. So there have been some attacks on IoT uh, so far. Okay, so how does this connect to the general malware space? This is a nice uh, photograph with different uh, malware. Uh, uh, you know, the dominant malware is Trojan. We'll talk about various uh, things that you see here. Phishing, as someone said about emails. Uh, spyware, firewalls, all of these things are related somehow to malware. Okay, so just quickly, for those of you who don't have a, um, a lot of experience with malware, uh, one common malware is the Trojan, okay? And the Trojan is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, someone sends you an email and says, you know, click on this, you can download a nice game. You say, great, you download it. Then this game contacts a remote server. The server, uh, you know, secretly installs some spyware on your computer that can log all the key uh, presses that you make on your computer. And then what happens, right? Well, you go to your bank and uh, your bank prompts you for a user ID and password and you type in your user ID and password. Well, if, it's, if there's a keyboard logger on your computer, then that information is sent to the adversary. So they can see that first you said www.bankofamerica.com and shortly after that you put in a user ID and something that looks like a password and you know, all of a sudden they have your credentials. They can open credit cards in your name. They can empty your accounts, do things like that. Okay, so that's what the bad guys are spending their time on now. Not so much IoT. Uh, how about your phone? Well, um, be very weary of things like free apps, especially uh, free apps, uh, free versions of things you usually have to pay for. You go onto the Play Store and you say, oh great, I can download this for free. Well, you download it and you might actually get the app, but what you might get with it is some malware. And that malware might execute a keyboard logger on your phone or it could execute a keyboard logger on your laptop that's connected with your phone. Okay. Another thing that malware could do is they, they can install something on your machine that turns it into a potential attack vector. So maybe uh, a little bot gets installed on your computer, which is just a little program that lies dormant, doesn't really do anything, and is waiting from some command and control center to give it a, an attack signal, right? So maybe your computer has been infected by a botnet, and maybe you have bots on your computer, and there are many, many infections uh, presently on a lot of computers. And what happens is these bot masters, they lease out botnets, so you say, if you're a bad guy, you say, I want to uh, do a targeted attack on this uh, web server. Um, what can I get for 50,000 bucks? And you know, some, someone on the dark web will uh, sell you uh, botnet services so you can launch your attack. And that attack might involve Pavlos' computer. You know, he might have a bot on his computer and unbeknownst to him, maybe participating in a distributed denial of service attack on some uh, enterprise. Okay, so we talked about ma ransomware. One thing I like to say about ransomware is it's the bad guys taking out a page of the playbook from the good guys. So what do the good guys do, the white hat hackers? They say, well, I want confidentiality of my transmissions. I want everything to be encrypted when it's going over the internet. I also want integrity. I want to make sure that the messages that are sent from the source to the destination don't get altered in between, okay? so. Um, they developed, you know, cryptography. Actually, uh, you're very close to MIT. Uh, a very famous cryptographer, Rivest, is there, uh, and other famous cryptographers, but he's very famous. Um, so the bad guy said, "Well, this seems like a really good idea. Uh, how can we use this for evil?" And they said, "Well, you know, we could do ransomware. So we basically take the idea of encryption, and instead of encrypting to hide 
the data of the white hat, the good person, uh, they do the opposite and they encrypt the data for malicious purposes, okay? So you'll see this in different situations in the cybersecurity space. Good ideas being used for bad uh, or good. Um, okay, so someone said about the email. Now, the number one attack vector for malware propagation today is phishing, okay? And the reason that it's the most uh, prominent is what? Why, why is phishing the, the most common attack vector? I know you know, because you know the answers to everything. Because so. it's easy yeah. to distribute. It's easy to distribute, right? I could send it to billions of people through email. It's cheap, right? It doesn't cost me anything to send an email. It works? Yes, it works. You know why it works? Because you get an email, it looks like it's from your bank. It's got the same fonts, it's got the same graphics, and it says click here to log in. You know, you need to change your password. Click this link. By the way, after this talk, I want to make sure that whenever you get an email that has any link in it, you should never click it. Okay, just remember me and just never click it. Even if, it, if you think it's from your boss, even if it is from your boss, do not click it. <laughs> okay? Uh, it'll save you a lot of grief. All right, so do not click any links on emails. And if you're uh, an organization that se sends emails with links, stop doing that. Okay, so what happens to victims is they, they get an email from uh, someone that says, it's time to change your Bank of America password. And uh, you know, just log in, click here to log in. You click on it. You type in your credentials because it serves up a web page. The web page looks exactly like Bank of America's web page, but it's malwarehack.com, some other web page. And you happily type in you know, your credentials. You don't know. And uh, what happens is the adversary gets your user ID and password and knows you have an account in Bank of America and then can go and exfiltrate your money. Right? So, so that's what they're really doing. They're not really, they don't really care about IoT yet because the stakes are still low. There's a lot of money to be made in, in things like credit card theft and you know, other, other kinds of theft. Now, what's the other common attack vector? vector? It could be something more technical like a buffer overflow attack. This is a little bit more technical than a phishing attack, but the idea here is that the world is controlled by software, and software is written by humans, and humans are imperfect beings and make mistakes. And what the hackers do is they find what those mistakes are in the code and they exploit them. And there are well-known techniques on how to test code for these kinds of common mistakes, and if you know how to do this exploit, you can send some data to a computer and then very quickly own that computer, you know, become root on that computer. Okay, so these kinds of attacks, if you t take my malware lab course at Drexel, you'll learn how to do this. Uh, the reason I teach this is not so you can become the next hacker, it's because you have to know what the hackers are doing if you're going to protect against the hackers. So, most people say, I don't have to worry about this because I'm running antivirus software. And that's great, running antivirus software is a good thing. But the way it works mostly is it basically has these signatures for every piece of uh, software, every program uh, uh, that is flagged as malware, has a binary signature, it's code. So you take some piece of that code long enough and you say, if you find this bit string in an executable file, that file is probably this, this malware. That's a great idea because it has a very low false positive rate. So you guys were talking about false positive rates. Very low false positive, if you have a really long bit string, maybe 20 bits, the likelihood that those bits are going to randomly appear in some other executable are very small, okay? So what you can do is you can put those in a signature database and push them out to every user, and what happens is your virus scanner is scanning all your executable files, or maybe even all your files on your computer, and if it finds that bit string, it flags it and says, you've been infected by this particular uh, uh, virus. Okay, now what, what could go wrong with this? I mean, this is a great idea. We've been using it for a long time, but what, what's, uh, if you're thinking like the bad guy, what do you do? You change your signature. How do you do that? How do you change the signature of your binary code? Not sure. How about stealing an idea out of the playbook of the good guys? We just talked about this idea. 
why don't we just encrypt the malware, okay? So when I'm sending the malware out, I don't send the malware as a regular executable. I encrypt the malware and I send out basically an encrypted version of the malware. Its signature, when it's on your hard disk, looks nothing like the signature of the malware because it's encrypted. Great, right? Well, sort of. Better for the bad guys, but what can the good guys do? Think about it. If the file is encrypted, what does the executable have to have in it to make that program run? It has to have a key and it also has to have a? A decryption algorithm, very good. So one piece of that malware is not encrypted because that's the piece of code that's gonna decrypt the encrypted part, okay? And you're gonna say, well, why don't we just encrypt that? Well, if you encrypt that, then you're gonna to have to have a decryptor for that. And it, you know, eventually you, <laughs> you're gonna run out of uh, levels of indirection. Okay, so sometimes these, uh, they're called polymorphic viruses. Sometimes the encryption is very silly, like just XOR with some bit string, you're, you have a key. But it's enough to uh, evade regular antivirus, okay? So what's the next step if you're a hacker? Encryption, okay, I'll give you a hint. It's stealing another idea out of the playbook of the good guys. Because <laughs> these, these hackers, they've taken all the courses, right? They've taken all the computer science courses. They know all the things they can do. All right, so, so what do you do? Steal the list, find the list of, of known addresses. Yeah, maybe, maybe. You're, you're close. You think like a malware author for a second. Your, your whole purpose in life is to hack computers. So you have to think a bit like, like, a, like a hacker. So what are you gonna do to your code? Every time you replicate that piece of malware, what do you want ideally? You want it to be different, right? You want it to be slightly different. How are you gonna do that? Well, as you know, you can take any program and change it and make it do basically the same thing in a different way. The good guys have done this before. So when these buffer overflow attacks first started, they said, well, one solution is, instead of everyone running exactly the same binary for every Apache web server, every time we compile that web server code, we're gonna change it a little bit. We're gonna randomize it a little bit. We're gonna move around the functions so the signatures aren't exactly the same so that if that particular executable gets hacked, it won't propagate to every installation of Apache, right? So they call this code diversification. So what do the hackers do? They say, malware diversification. So what I'm gonna do is every time I replicate, I'm going to change some of the instructions. I might take some junk code, maybe like the code for Angry Birds, and paste it into some part of the code that is unachievable. Like you could have something like, if false, Angry Birds, end. Okay, so you have all this code, in the signatures, it's Angry Birds, it doesn't get executed, but it's part of the signature, all right? And so what you could do is you can do that to your heart's content and make any program look completely different. It still does exactly the same thing, but it's got embedded in it all kinds of other goodies, and that, those kinds of malware are called metamorphic malware, okay? So this is uh, like Kafka's metamorphosis, okay? And of course, down here, I give you some ideas on how to do this. Uh, you can randomize instructions, you can reorder, reverse, negate uh, conditions, you can put garbage instructions like Angry Birds, you can move the storage around in the executable. So every time you copy your malware, you have a new species. It does the, the same thing, but it looks different, all right? So that's another way of evading the antivirus. Okay, now, if you're a good guy, what do you do? I, is it hopeless? I'll give you a hint, it was in the title of the talk. <laughs> yes? You uh, track the behavior of the virus instead of the signature. That's right. We know that the, so this gentleman said you track the behavior of the virus. So instead of looking for signatures of virus DNA, the bit strings that make up a virus, 
you see what the behavior of a, of a virus is, and that becomes your signature. What is it doing? Because it might be doing it using different instructions, but if it's doing the same thing to your computer, then it must be that malware. Okay. So the research question is... Could you help design it? Yes. Like your computer? Well, you the assumption to... underlying this talk is that your computer will be hacked. Once it's hacked, can you automatically detect the presence of the malware quickly with a low false alarm rate? Yeah, that's the question. Of course, what can you do if you're very careful? You can say, I will never run a program unless I run it first on this virtual machine and see if it's malware or not. Okay? So keep that in mind. Okay, so we're looking for classification of zero-day malware. Zero-day malware is the malware that doesn't have a signature in your antivirus program yet. Because what happens is the malware comes out, then someone from McAfee has to look at the malware and say, oh, there's a binary signature that looks pretty good. We'll put that in, propagate it to all the users of the antivirus program, and then they'll be able to detect it. Okay, so the solution is to look at behavior, and of course behavior uh, if you're thinking about data science, you're thinking about anomaly detection, okay? I was trying to get a video, a, a, a meme like this with goats, because we had a discussion yesterday at uh, bowling, if for those of you who were there, about goat yoga, and uh, I could only find sheep, so. Uh, uh, but how do you find <laughs> the black sheep among the white, the anomaly detection? Um, if you don't know what goat yoga is, Google it, it's funny. Um, this, okay. All right, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, how to do anomaly detection for something like an Alexa device, okay? So many of you have Amazon Echo in your house, right? Some kind of Alexa device. Well, you can embed Alexa into other devices. So there's a way where you can integrate it into other uh, things that you're building. You don't have to use Amazon Echo if you don't want to. Um, Amazon Echo is a closed platform, so what we thought is we want to do some kind of study of uh, seeing how can we protect uh, you know, these uh, devices uh, using anomaly detection. So what we did is we constructed uh, a version of Echo, sort of, uh, and it's called Alexa Pi. So we took a Raspberry Pi, you guys know what a Raspberry Pi is? Right? It's a little $20 computer, uh, and we essentially added a bunch of bells and whistles to it and turned it into an Alexa-enabled device. All right, and because, uh, well, we'll talk about this, but we tried to make it look as close as possible to something that would be realistically available on the market. So the easy thing to do was we, we took one of these devices, we built it, and then we uh, found a lot of covariates, potentially, in, in this uh, device, things that we can measure about the device, and we ran it, and we took all of the data uh, when this device pre-infection, so assuming this device does not have a malware infection, we gathered a lot of data about it, built a model, and that's a, a model of normal operation of the device. Then we took malware from the wild. Mirai was one of the famous IoT malware, and we subjected it to these malware, and the anomaly detector does spectacularly well at detecting that something is not Alexa and it's actually malware. Why? Because IoT devices are very regular. They're not like regular computers that do lots of things. They do very few things all the time, right? So they're very specialized. And that's really good if you're doing anomaly detection. And we said, well, that's not an interesting scientific uh, question. Of course, if you have malware and you put it on something that never behaves like malware and you do anomaly detection, well, you're gonna detect all the malware for sure. So I thought, well, I'm not gonna talk about that, that's boring. Uh, we did that experiment, it, in, in two minutes we knew that, okay, that's, that's something that's achievable. So I put my black hat on, and I'm saying, I'm gonna design malware for the future. Well, what kind of malware can I build to trick something that is protecting a device like this? And the reason I'm thinking this way is not because I want to make that malware specifically, or I wanna teach someone to make that malware, but people who are developing malware are already thinking like this, okay? And what are they thinking? Well, they're saying, I want to create malware that maybe exfiltrates conversations you're having with Alexa and send them to a remote server. That's what I want. 
and I don't want to get caught while I'm doing it. Can I make such a malware? Absolutely. All right, so this is the thing that I'm talking about. I'm building an anomaly detector over here, and I'm using different covariates. I'm using different things in my machine learning. In parallel, I'm also building a malware sample that has degrees of freedom, and I'm varying these degrees of freedom to make it more or less stealth, okay? More or less like the Alexa platform. All right, one of the things is I can modify the intensity of operation. The more I exfiltrate things from the device, the more suspicious I become, right? Makes sense, right? Um, if you're trying to exfiltrate money out of your bank account, you're not gonna send, you know, one dollar every second, you know, your bank eventually is gonna say, that's kind of weird. Um, also, if you try to send a million dollars all at once, they're gonna say, well, that's kind of weird, all right? So you have to find some kind of medium to that. Another thing we looked at is flow duration. Well, when you're connecting to this device, how often, how long do these connections last? So you can imagine lots of degrees of freedom that you can build into your malware that you're co-evolving with your anomaly detector. So what you say is, I build my anomaly detector, I, I catch all the malware, yay. Then you put your black hat on, you say, well, I'm gonna change the malware and make it more stealth and see if, what you could do there. And then you say, oh, I can't detect that kind of malware anymore. So what do you do? Well, you build a better anomaly detector. And you say, I could beat that anomaly, I could beat that malware, then the malware changes and goes back and forth. So if you're gonna do research in this space, you need to have that kind of synergy, the white hat, black hat sort of mindset. You can't just live in this side of the world and say, I'm just gonna find malware in the wild, try it out, and if it works, then I'm gonna claim victory, because that's too easy. Okay, so, um, some of the things that we were trying to do with this work is we wanted to see what are the covariates that make most uh, impact. Are these operating system command covariates or are they more networking uh, covariates? Uh, we also wanted to see um, when we're co-evolving the malware, what are the most important degrees of freedom in the malware so that we can make it more stealth and make it trickier for um, um, anomaly detectors to, to pick up. And then at the end, we wanted to create a data set. And as you know from your classes, creating the data set is a lot of hard work, okay? And getting good data and making sure that the data has uh, integrity, it takes a lot, a lot of effort. Okay, so the process is something like this. Build a Pi, Alexa Pi, collect the data, do some kind of a machine learning on the data and see what happens. And then do this again and again, iterate while you're evolving the malware. All right, so if you look at the architecture of um, our device, at the bottom we have the $25 Raspberry Pi hardware. We install Raspbian OS on top of that, which is open source micro Linux. Uh, and then through that we can make calls to the operating system from our applications. The applications are the things that are running on the Pi like the Alexa-enabled uh, libraries, and maybe malware. We're tracking system calls, chains of system calls. So remember, system calls from your operating system class is uh, commands that your program is making to the OS to open files, to open network connections, and do things like that. We're also keeping track of all the network activity that's happening in the Pi using TCP dump. Uh, forget about FakeNet for a while. It's, a, it's more complicated for what we have time to talk about now. So we built the Alexa Pi, this is it. The Pi is actually this computer right here, that's the motherboard. And we hooked it up to a, print, a, uh, a keyboard, a display, a monitor, uh, and uh, basically, you know, you don't really need the display but, uh, to, to have the Alexa Pi experience, but we had it for debugging purposes. And this whole setup uh, didn't cost, it, it cost under $100 excluding the monitor. If you look at Raspbian, it's basically a Unix variant, specifically Linux, Debian, Ubuntu, Raspbian. That's the phylogeny of the operating system. It comes pre-installed with a bunch of junk that we removed, Minecraft and uh, Mathematica and, <laughs> uh, I don't know why, uh, Minecraft, but okay. Um, and also we picked Raspbian because uh, it's, it has good support. It, it's also compatible with the Alexa API that's made available to us uh, through Amazon. 
Okay, one of my master students, Alex Duff, built Heimdall sensors. And the Heimdall sensors, basically, you run the sensors on the platform, and what it does is it records all of the system calls that any program, any process on the OS makes to the underlying kernel. Okay, so it keeps track of all the file opens and all the network connections, all the memory allocations, etc. We also have TCP dump, which is a standard tool. It uses libpcap to capture packets and it stores it in a pcap file. So this gives you all the network activity that's going on between the Alexa Pi and the server of Amazon or the server of the malicious actor. So the process to create an Alexa Pi image, and this could be something that we could have done in a classroom, is you download the Raspbian OS image, you create a virtual disk drive, you install the Raspbian OS, you uninstall all the junk, you install TCP dump, Heimdall sensors, you install the Alexa API client libraries, and then you back up everything on a micro SD card. Why do we back up everything on the micro SD card? Because we're gonna try different experiments. Some of them are benign, you're just gonna run regular code, no, no problem. But once you start running malware on this platform, you're gonna kinda ruin the platform. So you wanna have a clean image so that after you infect it, you could just pop in the clean image and start all over again. Okay, so uh, we built the, the malware on the side. Uh, this is take one of building the malware. And take one was let's vary the frequency of data exfiltration. Now the way it works, the Alexa uh, platform is, Alexa waits for you to say the word Alexa. And as soon as you say the word Alexa, it sort of takes whatever you said, package that up and send it to a server. Right? That's all the device does. And then the server interprets you know, what you've asked, figures out an answer, sends you back a audio file with the answer. That audio file then gets played through your speaker and then you can listen to the weather or whatever your favorite song is. But also that answer gets stored on the computer and it stays on the computer until you ask another question. That could be a few seconds, that could be a whole month. So there's an opportunity for the adversary to do some exfiltration. Okay, now if you're thinking like the bad guy, you want to exfiltrate as much as, you, as much as possible, but you don't want to overdo it, okay? So that's the degree of freedom. The first parameter is how frequent is the exfiltration? Do I do it every second, every five seconds, every 30 seconds? Okay. Uh, obviously, the less frequent the exfiltration, the more stealth the malware, right? That makes sense. It's not doing anything. It doesn't look like it's malicious. If you're exfiltrating every, every second, well, that looks suspicious. Interesting uh, note is that every 60 minutes, uh, an Alexa Pi device sends a, uh, a, a small packet to the server saying, I'm still here. That's an opportunity for, a, for the hacker, right? So you know, specifically, every 60 minutes, you can send some information, and it, it could look like that's just the live token from the Alexa Pi or the Alexa device. Okay, so that was take one. We look at our data and we find out that, well, when you look at principal component analysis, and I know some of you haven't done that yet, you're doing it next week, we're doing it Wednesday, so this is a, a maybe, a, but some of you have already taken the course. All right, so if you look at the PCA, uh, you see that flow duration seems to be a good indicator. All right, so what happens if I make the malware such that I control the flow duration, that is, how long is the network connection between the client and the server, okay? Um, if I make the flow duration look a lot like the Alexa average flow duration, then maybe I become more stealth, all right? So that, that's take two. The take two, we have two degrees of freedom. One is frequency of exfiltration. The other one is the uh, flow duration. And what I've circled here is, this is super easy to detect and this is super hard to detect. So if I make malware that has non-Alexa-like flow durations and exfiltrates very frequently, one second, then uh, that's a signature that's very easy to detect using any anomaly detector. However, if I exfiltrate rarely, like every 30 seconds, and I use Alexa-like flow durations, guess what happens? I, I can't detect the malware very easily, even if I know that um, these are parameters of the problem, and I'll show you how this affects the the machine learning analysis. Okay, so the data collection, 
Some of your data is going to look like this. This is system calls that applications, every process on your, uh, on your computer makes to the OS. This says I'm running bash, which is a shell. This is the process ID. This is the timestamp. And this is the syscall number that's given by the operating system. 16 means bash. Now beneath that is the TCP dump, which shows you the network traffic. And you can see uh, there's the source, destination IP, version of the protocol, length of packets, which version of IP, et cetera. Okay, so lots of information from network traffic. These are the different covariates that we're going to use. And now we're going to do our data gathering. Now, as you know, half of the battle, even more than half of the battle in data science is getting the data. So if you're looking at something at a, like a pie, you have to start considering how is it used. It could be used in idle mode. That means I have a pie in my bedroom and I'm sleeping or, you know, assuming I don't talk in my sleep, especially I don't say Alexa, you know, that this thing is just sitting there doing nothing. Maybe it's in uh, my basement and I don't go to my basement for a month. But that program is still running, that computer is still doing something. So let's gather some data in the idle mode. Second, we'll talk about the ambient mode. I have Alexa in my living room and I'm having a dinner party and we're all talking about things but we're not saying the word Alexa. We're just talking, you know, about football, about, you know, machine learning. And uh, we gather data about that because even when the Alexa device is in ambient mode, the operating system is doing stuff. Network packets are being transmitted. So there's activity happening. And then there's query mode. This is when you finally say, Alexa, all right? There's different kinds of actions that take place when that happens, all right? So we have to create uh, data for at least these three different categories. Maybe there are more categories that I haven't thought about. Likewise, we have to look at these categories when there's no malware infection on the Pi versus when there is malware infection on the Pi. All right, so you have a lot of data to collect here, right? Six categories of data, at least. Maybe there are more. <sighs> okay, so we have the uh, Alexa Pi. We install all of the good software that we get from Amazon. Uh, one of the things that's running on my Pi is the wake word engine, which is the thing that listens to you, uh, your conversation and sees if you say the word Alexa. It connects to the uh, uh, cloud th to Amazon. Answers get played back on your speaker. Audio signal processor uh, processes inputs uh, that it hears from your uh, query environment or your ambient environment. All right, so the, in order to get the right covariates, uh, we use a tool called CIC flow meter. And what this does is it takes all of that TCP dump information that I showed you, and it turns it into interesting covariates that we can use. Uh, and I'll show you some of the examples. I, I don't expect you to memorize all these, but these are some of the covariates that are, are presented. Uh, you know, number of packets, how many fin uh, packets you have, how many sin packets you have, um, what max, min, standard deviations, averages. So it has tons of uh, information about the TCP dump that it analyzed. Okay, so we use this tool, and it gives you CSV files that look like this. Um, so you have flow IDs, source and destination IP, the ports, timestamps, you know, all kinds of goodies. Likewise, for the system calls, we get Heimdall giving us all the system calls that every process is making to every, uh, um, um, to the OS kernel. And we also create n-grams for these. So you're going to talk about n-grams uh, at, at some point in the curriculum, I imagine. This is like maybe looking at one system call at a time, or pairs of system calls, or triplets of system calls. Triplets is about as much as you want to do, because you don't want to get really long strings. It's too much data. Um, and then we use machine learning to do some, make some sense out of this. All right, so because we only have benign data in our training, we don't have ma malicious data, we can use this one class support vector machine. You don't have to use the RBF kernel, you can use a linear kernel, we use the RBF kernel. Uh, but essentially what it's doing is it's creating these small areas where all of the um, data that you got for the networking data and the syscall data is all 
uh, sort of uh, clustered in, if you like, and everything that's outside of that is uh, potentially malware space. So if, if you're running a program and in a small window of time you landed somewhere outside of these uh, areas, then you're probably malware. So when we first tried this, we were a little disappointed because we got data that looked like this. And we said, oh, it doesn't look like we can separate malware from benign because it all looks like it's all messed up together. Uh, so take two, um, we said, well, that's because when we're, we're supposed to be looking at this like a time series because, you know, maybe your computer is going to get infected but is not infected currently and it's not infected for the first second, the second, second, third, second, fourth second, but in the fifth second it's, it gets infected. So you don't want to count those previous seconds as infected data. You want to say that this, that's non-infected data and the infected data only occurs after you instantiate the malware. So if you start doing that and you start bucketing the observations in some time interval, then you get this nice separation here. This is only looking at two principal components. And of course your uh, um, detection rate goes up significantly from 57% to close to 100% in this case. Okay, so this is just showing you the system call data. If I have system call number 11 followed by 248 in that time period and that occurs in four n-grams, then I put a four in my spreadsheet. Likewise for uh, network traffic, uh, I have source destination IP addresses, uh, ports, um, maybe in this time interval the most common average port that was accessed was this port. Um, so that's one way to get information out of TCP dump. So we end up with tons and tons of data, lots of potential uh, optimizations here. We have 237 features that were taken from the network traffic data and over 3,300 features extracted from the system calls. Now why, the, why are the system call features so, so large in number versus the network features? Well, the OS has how many system calls? A few hundred, okay? But if we take pairs of system calls or triplets of system calls, then we have many, many, many system calls. Okay, so what we do is we try to reduce that uh, by using PCA. When you take your PCA lectures, you'll see uh, you can take linear combinations of the feature set, uh, do cross-validation and look at the R, R square score. And as you'll see here, uh, if I get up to about 20 uh, linear combinations, I get a pretty good score. So maybe I don't have to look at all of the data, I can just look at a small subset of the data and that'll get me where I want to be. Uh, so that's, that's using um, the machine learning uh, infrastructure. This is just, you know, if you're interested, these are the principal components for uh, the network features, uh, PC1 and PC2. Uh, and these are the most common system call features. I don't expect you to make heads or tails out of this, but this is at least showing you what a system call looks like. Right. Um, so finally, uh, we have all of our data. We have our machine, we've reduced the dimensionality, uh, and now we're ready to analyze uh, our results. So we have uh, the good data that we use to build our anomaly detector with our one class support vector machine. And then we have our malicious data that we've uh, created on the side after infecting the uh, pi with uh, our malware using different uh, um, degrees of freedom. All right, so we only have time to talk about this really hard case. So I'm not going to talk about the easy cases because we do really well on the easy cases. This is the hard case. This is where I'm doing Alexa-like flow durations and exfiltrations every 30 seconds. All right, so if you look at this, these slides, this is, these are the results we get in the quiet, quiet environment. So if I train the Pi on a quiet environment and I infect it when it's in a quiet environment, guess what? Uh, just the system call alone gets me a ROC curve with a hundred uh, 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 area, well, or one area under the, the curve. Uh, if I'm looking at network traffic, it's not as good, but if I take the combination of the two, I get, you know, excellent results. Okay, that's if the pie is in a quiet environment. That's not surprising that 
you know, you get a pretty good anomaly detector if you never say the word Alexa, if you never have any amb ambient conversations in the environment. All right, when you test it in an ambient environment, this is where I'm having conversations in the room, but I'm not actually saying the word Alexa. You'll see that the system call uh, area under the curve becomes more like 0.97 and the network traffic uh, area under the curve becomes more like 0.94. But if I use both data, I get an area under the curve that's one on average, which is saying that if I just look at system calls, you get some results. If I just look at network data, you get some results. But if I take the, the combination of those two data, then I get better results. And that's something that uh, is a little bit surprising to us. Um, actually, there were uh, two of us, one said that network data is all that matters because all you're looking at is whether it's hitting those Amazon servers or not. And I was saying, no, no, everything is about the OS. If you're doing weird things, then you'll catch it in the memory allocations and in the uh, opening of files and whatnot. Now, this is the hard case. This is when I'm doing querying, okay? Now, we only have time to look at querying in a quiet regime, but here is where I have a device in my office and I'm saying, Alexa, tell me the weather, Alexa, uh, uh, you know, play this song by Michael Jackson, whatever. Uh, and um, what you see here is if you just look at system calls, your area under the curve falls to like 74%. If you're looking at network traffic, it's about 77%. But if you take into consideration both of those data, it's like 94%. And this is just using the anomaly detector uh, in query mode in a quiet environment. Uh, and I think this is a pretty good result. It's not a surprising result because, as we said, these devices are not doing that much. Yeah, they're running an operating system, but that operating system is a pretty regular operating system. It doesn't have a lot of users logging in and doing all weird things, installing lots of packages. It's doing very specialized things uh, in very specialized time periods. So if you look on the left, you look arbitrary flow durations and frequent exfiltration means it's easy to detect the malware. If you go to more Alexa-like flow directions and infrequent exfiltration, it becomes harder to detect the malware. Um, but still, if you combine the different kinds of sensors, you can do uh, all right, maybe even up to 92%. All right, so let's conclude. Uh, first, we created the Alexa Pi IoT device. We created some malware in parallel to do exfiltration and uh, uh, of the data that's on the Pi, uh, looking at the parameters of exfiltration frequency and flow duration. We also created three malware detectors, one that just took into account system call data, one that took into account network traffic data, and one that took both of them into account. Surprisingly, when you add the two data together, it gives you better results. Another surprise was that ambient system call data is more like query data than idle data. Okay, so that's another finding that we had. Um, and things we would like to try in the near future is to do querying with ambient noise. How does it perform when there's a dinner party and you're trying to do Alexa queries? No doubt you've had this before. Um, Alexa might sort of pop up and answer a question even though you didn't intend that to happen. We also want to improve our malware design uh, we only have two degrees of freedom in our malware right now, but our malware doesn't do things like replication, so it doesn't try to propagate, doesn't try to replicate, and it doesn't have any malware resilience. So most malware, when they land on your computer, there's another little malware whose only job is to make sure that if you delete the malware, that it re reinstalls it on your computer. All right, so we didn't put any of those parameters into our, our test case. If you put those parameters in, it becomes easier to detect the malware, okay? So again, we're gonna go through this dance where we're trying to make the malware more stealth and then we're gonna make a different anomaly detector and keep on doing this. Uh, of course, we can also try to uh, introduce bugs into the Alexa API, uh, into the open source code, and then uh, try to exploit it using uh, attacks. Okay, so I'll leave you now with uh, Alexa to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, all right. Any questions? Yes? So you talked about uh, how to detect when the, when the malware's on the device. 
Yeah. Now, with an Alexa device, it's only connected to Amazon servers, yes. right? So how would you get mal as a, as a black, black hat hacker, how would you get the malware onto the device? Yes. Okay, so uh, how would, the question is, how would you get the malware onto the device if all the Alexa device is doing is connecting to the Amazon server, right? Well, uh, it could be that, um, uh, think about the IoT. IoT is, you're putting this thing in your home, uh, and maybe uh, your router on your home gets, it gets hacked. And maybe the route, because the router is basically just another Linux computer that's routing packets. And maybe once it's on your home, uh, it could start doing some kind of man in the middle, altering, altering packets as it go goes to Amazon. Another way is maybe you attack the phone. The phone does system upgrades for your Pi. Maybe you hack that software, and when it delivers a patch, it also has the malicious uh, code on the device. Uh, I mean, the, there are many creative ways of getting the malware on the computer, and in fact, that's a whole other talk. You know, how do you? What are the attack vectors on on these devices? Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Is it possible to learn the malware and create a two-man game, like to automatically learn the malware while you're trying to defend it, and then get the malware to be better? Or is your detection to be better, and then you you get into some Nash equilibrium. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So hard. like a two-man game. In fact, I've been trying to get. We have a game theorist at, at Drexel. I'm tr trying to get him interested in this problem, because clearly it looks like a game theory problem. Uh, now the automatic part, uh, I guess, I suppose. I mean, if you're looking at the principal components, you might say, oh, it looks like these are really important oh, variants. Some kind of a gun. Uh, Yes, if we design a highly parameterizable malware, we can play with the thresholds on those degrees of freedom and do a Nash equilibrium that way. So that, that would be something that I would love to do. I just don't know enough game theory to do that, but maybe you know enough game theory to do that. But we, we could talk about that. Yeah. Yes? Well, first I tried to put on classic IoT malware that attack IoT devices like Mirai. Mirai is very easy to do. It's it, easy to detect because uh, its signature, its behavioral signature is so different from Alexa. Right? And if you take any one of those and you drop it onto the Pi, you'll detect it quickly because its behavior is very different. It's going to start um, storing files. It's going to start replicating things, doing memory allocations. However, if you're trying to attack a device like this, you're probably going to start thinking more like the malware design that we were doing. How do you create a malware that's stealth once it's on the machine? And what are the kinds of things that the attacker would be thinking about? So yeah, we, we, had, to, we had to do custom malware. I mean, the, the, the malware side of this equation is stuff that we built. But you know that malware is completely benign in the sense that it, it, it doesn't propagate, it doesn't replicate, you know. But it, it does exfiltrate. But you know it's my pie. So. All right. So let's hope you don't move to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> I have two hats. I can put one on or the other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks.